behalf of uh, those brethren at Herald of Hope, we're glad that you're here. Thank you for taking the time to come as we learn a little bit together. I think for many of you, this is probably not as much new learning as a reinforcement of things that you know. And as we study these things together, it uh, might be a bit of a refreshing for some of us, but one of the things that I think the design of this is, is uh, just to cause us to long for heaven just a bit more. Um, the Lord said of Himself that the, that the testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. And uh, we, see, we see prophetic things unraveling all around us all the time, even this very day, things are happening. And uh, just reminds us of the soon return of our Savior, doesn't it? All right, we're in Revelation chapter number 17. The two, the two focuses for me today is, first of all, here as we think about the king and the kingdom, we're looking at this religious kingdom. And uh, we know it to be Mystery Babylon. So we'll look at this here, and then we'll look at some other things here after that. So Revelation chapter 17, we'll read a fair bit of the chapter off and on through this hour. But notice with me in verse number 1. We okay on this? Okay. John says this in verse number one. There came one of the seven angels which had the seven vials and talked with me saying unto me, Come hither and I will show thee the judgment of the great whore that sitteth upon many waters with whom the kings of the earth have committed fornication and the inhabitants of the uh, earth have been made drunk with the wine of her fornication. So he carried me away in the spirit into the wilderness and I saw a woman sit upon a scarlet colored beast full of names of blasphemy having seven heads and ten horns. And the woman was arrayed in purple and scarlet color and decked with gold and precious stones and pearls, having a golden cup in her hand full of abominations and filthiness of her fornication. And upon her forehead was a name written, Mystery, Babylon the Great, the mother of harlots and abominations of the earth. And I saw the woman drunken with the blood of the saints and with the blood of the martyrs of Jesus, and when I saw her, I wondered with great admiration. Now, the admiration John speaks of here is not the way we would consider admiring today. The admiration is a sense of dread and awe at the, the magnitude of this thing that he saw. So John is now looking at uh, this woman, which we'll look at here uh, together today. So uh, I'll trust your familiarity with the Bible here. Uh, there's, there's much that we cannot read and talk about just due to the amount of time that we have for this session. So I'll trust that you're familiar with certain things. But I just want to draw your attention to these two chapters, 17 and 18, uh, deal with Babylon. And you need to understand when you look at these two chapters here that Babylon uh, is not just a religion. Babylon is also a city. So in chapter 17, what you see is you see the, the religion here. Uh, both of these things are true, okay? You see the religion, the religious system in chapter 17. Chapter 18, you see the city, okay? So both of those things are referred to here uh, as Babylon. Uh, but uh, they're, they're two different things, although they are similar together, and they, they sort of coincide with one another. For our study today, I'll, I'll give reference to the city in chapter 18, but more focus on the religious system that the Lord lays out for us here. So I want to just show you, first of all, what the kingdom is, what this kingdom is that's, that's uh, given to us here. If you notice in verse number one, the angel says to, to John here, I want to show you the judgment of, and then the descriptor here is, uh, the great whore that sitteth upon many waters. Now that's a fairly uh, blunt statement, but as you read the Bible, you understand that the Lord does not pull any punches when He, when he talks about certain things. And uh, this is certainly the case here. When the, when the Lord is using this terminology, this is a deliberate wording that the Lord gives it to us here because it's, it's defining something about this harlot, what this harlot is. You notice here that this, the, uh, the harlot was one who manipulates what's true and right for her own pleasure or profit. And in this, time, in, in this tense here, what the Lord is doing is He's referring to this end-time religion. That's what He's dealing with here. And He's using that by talking about whoredom. Uh, you might be familiar with um, the book of Hosea. Actually, oftentimes through the Old Testament, the Lord gives reference to this exact thing. Uh, speaking out of the spiritual idolatry of Israel as a nation, the book of Hosea is full of this. The idolatry of the nation, and He defines that as whoredom. He speaks of his own people that have committed whoredom against me. And so that's what he's dealing with here uh, when he talks about this harlot. I don't know what's happening here. And I apologize. There may be a, we have a connection issue. Um, and I'm not sure where that's at. So um, let me go back. Something has happened. All right. Let me get back to this. 
All right, so let's just uh, see if we can get through this without the... If it's going to happen, it's going to happen on this, right? Is it, um, all right, so let's talk about what this kingdom is. We know that, that God defines this kingdom as a harlot in Revelation chapter 17, but it's also this kingdom is a mystery. And you notice what he defines this is a mystery in verse number five. And you notice in your Bible, there's a, there's a comma there. We, we oftentimes refer to this as mystery Babylon, right? But notice the, the way that grammatically it's defined here, mystery, comma, Babylon the Great. So it's, it's important you understand why that's there. This is a mystery, this religion, the Babylon the Great. Now what mystery in the Bible is referring to is not sometimes the way we view secret societies, the mysterious societies. It's not a secret handshake and a funny hat. A mystery in the Bible is really something that had previously not been revealed to men, something previously not understood. And so in John's day, this angel is revealing something to John, just like he's, he did with Paul. The Lord revealed mysteries of the church age and uh, the, the New Testament doctrines that had previously not been understood. And so it is here. That's what a mystery is, something hidden from the eyes of men. But God now is revealing this to John. And what you need to understand about this mystery called Babylon the Great is that it has a more profound impact on the world than any and all of the great wars of mankind combined. You look at the combined wars of mankind since the history of the world. We have no way of knowing how many people have died in warfare, but let's just say hundreds of millions of men down through history have died in warfare. But you look at the, the impact of this religious system that God defines for us here. The impact is in the billions of humanity that have been influenced by this religious system. It's, it has a far greater uh, impact because so many billions of people have been deceived by this religious system down through history that are now uh, in hell and will one day spend eternity in the lake of fire because of this deception. This whole thing is about deception. So let's talk about this religious system then. This religious system. What, what this kingdom is, is a religious system. Now I want to say some things about this and we'll go, we'll go into it in more depth as uh, we get into this session today. This system of Mystery Babylon, it predates Roman Catholicism by thousands of years. It's important that we understand what this is, okay? It predates Catholicism by a long time. See, when you go back into the, to the early chapters of Genesis and you see origins and as God is defining things that will come to pass in this world, what we see is we see Nimrod, who had the, uh, the Tower of Babel and the system of religion that, um, that was in Genesis in chapter number 10. And if, uh, if you were to go back and look at Nimrod's life and study through that, you would find out that it was here uh, in, in Nimrod's time that began the worship of the, of the stars and the planets. This was the, the study of astrology. This is where it had its origin. Um, this is where it became systematized, this religious system became systematized under Nimrod. And then when the, when the nations were dispersed from Babel, uh, it followed mankind out everywhere that mankind went. So all of it had its origins in Babel in Genesis chapter 10. I'd encourage you to go back and read through that and study through the, the life uh, historically of, of Nimrod. If you're in chapter 17, notice it says in verse number 3 that he sees the woman in verse number 3. Uh, upon a scarlet colored beast full of names of blasphemy having seven heads and ten horns. Notice this woman rides the beast here and the beast is defined which we'll look at later on but in, in verse number 10 the beast is described to us here in verse number 10 uh, is the kings. Notice it says there are there are seven kings five are fallen one is and the other is not yet come. So when you think about this woman this woman is riding the beast the beast is defined as kings which we'll come back to and look at but that's also important as we try to define what mystery Babylon is. Now, back to my thought on, on Nimrod. Let's consider this for just a minute. I've, I've given you the ziggurat here as, as far as a picture here, but Nimrod is the one who systematized this false religion uh, which spread worldwide at the dispersion here. And Nimrod was the son of Cush, as you probably know from the Word of God. Cush was called uh, Bar Cush uh, or Bacchus. You, familiar with the name Bacchus, right? That is, that is Nimrod, who among the Greeks and Roman gods, he was called the invigorating power of the world. This was Nimrod. And when you look at, when you look at the, um, the religions of the world today, some of these names may, may stand out to you. Nimrod is Kronos, or Saturn, the king of Babylon. Uh, Nimrod is the winged boy god Cupid. Uh, Nimrod is the Roman god Mars, who was the god of, the god of war. 
Uh, Nimrod is the centaur, half horse and half man. Um, and it had its origin, not in Greece, as it's oftentimes thought, but in ancient Babylon, commemorating and deifying Nimrod as God. Um, it was seen in the Zodiac as Sagittarius, the archer. This is Nimrod. Nimrod is Osiris, the child of the Egyptian Madonna called the strong chief of buildings. This is Nimrod. Nimrod is Bacchus of Greece. Nimrod is Baal as the Assyrians called him. All of these names would be very, very familiar to you um, as Bible-believing Christians. And when you think about Nimrod himself and, and this system of religion that started there at, at Babylon, when you think about Nimrod, here in Nimrod's day began the, began the sacrifice of children uh, to the false gods. Okay, this began in, in Nimrod's time. And uh, there it was called uh, Ka Kana, which is priest, Kana, Baal, which was Baal, from which we get the English word today, our, in our language, the devourer of human flesh, cannibal, comes from this, the systematized religion of Nimrod as Baal. Nimrod is also Tammuz, as you would be familiar in the book of Ezekiel, the women which were weeping through the, the, for, for Tammuz. Remember, God says to Ezekiel, I'm going to show you greater abominations than these, and he digs through the wall, and there are the women who are weeping for Tammuz. Tammuz is is Nimrod. So all of this is, is one system of religion that had its origin or founding uh, in ancient Babel from which we get, of course, Babylon. This is the mystery religion. This is what the mystery is that God was unveiling to John and the Spirit of God is trying to get us to understand that's in the world today. Now the wife of Nimrod was Semiramis. Have you heard of Semiramis? She was the dove goddess who was worshipped as the Divine Mother uh, and the Protector of the Son. And Semiramis is also known as, and you'd be familiar with some of these names, Ashtaroth. You familiar with that in Judges 2 and other places in the New Testament? And, sorry, the Old Testament? Where the nations uh, around Israel were worshippers of this goddess Ashtaroth, and even Israel itself was guilty of found worshipping this goddess. Uh, Semiramis, the wife of Nimrod, was also known as Astarte. You would know Aphrodite, perhaps, or Venus. How about Diana of the Ephesians that Paul uh, dealt with uh, in the book of Acts in chapter number 19? Uh, you might be familiar with Artemis or even the word Isis. Many of you would be familiar with Isis, this goddess. Okay, what is this? This is the wife of Nimrod. All of this had its origin point in Babel all those years ago in Genesis in chapter 10. Okay, this is this mystery religion that the Lord is, is defining for us. So this religious system then has existed almost since the beginning of time. And you can see how ancient this is. And so when John sees this mystery Babylon show up here, he sees an ancient religious system that has now today, at least in John's day, when he, remember now John was 2,000 years ago who saw the vision, right? But John was looking at a future thing, correct? He was seeing something that had now taken its form uh, years later from John. So you and I are looking at a system that, is, that has existed since nearly the beginning of human history. But we need to understand that its form has now flowed into what we understand today to be Rome under the guise of the Roman Catholic Church. So when you see this defined uh, in the Bible, you'll understand why. Notice what the Lord says of it in verse number 5. Genesis, uh, sorry, Revelation 17 and verse number 5. And upon her forehead was a name written, Mystery, Babylon the Great, the mother of harlots and abominations of the earth. The mother of harlots in verse number 5. So what it shows here then is that this mystery religion called Babylon the Great, this mystery religion, uh, is the source, the representative of all false religion that John is now seeing manifested in the future. Now, for you and I, it exists today, but in John's day, it was yet future, and it was in a, in a particular form uh, during, the time of, uh, during the time of the Great Tribulation where John is seeing all of this. So this is the, the, the representative, if you will, of all of the mystery religions that are wrapped up into one uh, of idolatry and false religion in John's, in John's vision. Now, this mystery religion is most prominent and visible today in the form of Roman Catholicism. And it's important that we understand that and be able to speak the truth of that. Um, there are many dear people that are born and raised in Catholicism that don't know this. 
I sat with a woman in my office this week who had, um, had started coming to our church for the, maybe the last several weeks now. And uh, very dear, very sincere, very confused. And we sat for about two and a half hours this a couple of days ago and just went through the Bible. And it was just amazing to watch uh, with the scriptures. You just saw the light come on. She just understood when we went through all of scripture, not just here, but just many other places, the light came on and she understood the deception of everything that she'd been taught. So it's not that, that Roman Catholics are bad people. It's not that. The, the system that we see represented here by the Roman Catholic Church is important to understand because God gives you a very clear definition of it here. So the mystery religion that we can see, I do apologize, I'm not sure. Just notice this that I've said here that, the, that Catholicism uh, is the fruit, it's not the root. Understand the difference here. It was not the origin. When, when John was seeing this mystery religion, it's not that Catholicism in its current form has existed down through 6,000 years of human history. It hasn't. It is just the fruit of it. It's not the root of it. The mother-son religion is the oldest system of idolatry in the world. So let's look at this. The mother goddess religion. Here's some, some names that might be familiar to you. Samarimus and Tammuz of the Babylonians. Uh, Isis and Osiris of the Egyptians. Uh, you may not have heard of this. Xingmu, the mother goddess of the Chinese, same religion. Hertha of the Germans. The Daisa of the Scandinavians. Nutria of the Etruscans. Virgo of the Druids. Indrani of the Indians. Aphrodite of the Greeks. Nana of the Sumerians, Venus of the Romans, Diana of the Ephesians, and of course, that exact same religion, the exact same religion is found in the worship of the Madonna and the child of Rome. Exactly the same religion. It's simply a Christianized form of the Babylonian religion that has existed since Nimrod's time. This paganism, and then of course it was brought into mainstream by Constantine in the 4th century. That's where it was. So regardless of of her name or her place in human history. She was the, the wife of Baal. She was the virgin queen of heaven, and she's been worshipped by men since Nimrod's time. And it's still happening right here today, in our world, everywhere in our world. So this is a satanic counterfeit. I think we probably know that. All of this is a satanic counterfeit of what's real. And Satan's counterfeit here, it had its infancy in Babylon, <laughs> and it's had its maturity in Rome. So please understand that it's been around for a long time. Uh, several years ago, I was, uh, I was in Rome, and uh, I went to the, um, to the Roman Pantheon. Has anybody ever been there? So I went to the Roman Pantheon, and you know, you just sort of you stand in awe of the structure, the ancient structure. And I, I, I was by myself, and I just walked around in there. Uh, there weren't many people there. One of the staff came to have a conversation with me, a, a very nice Catholic lady, and we, we began to have a, a, a nice long conversation. And she said to me, she said, I had asked her about all the alcoves around the Pantheon where there used to be evidently statues. And I asked, well, what happened to the statues? And she said, well, some Pope years ago, whatever the Pope was, came in and they stripped the Pantheon of its marble, it used to be covered in white marble, stripped the Pantheon of its marble, took the statues of the Roman Pantheon and took them to the Vatican and said that they're now the 12 uh, apostles. Okay, now, now she was a lost Catholic woman herself. But I just found that to be very insightful and illustrative, I think, of the point that we're making here. It's an indication of the shifting nature of this religious system. It's a shifting nature. It, it has the same basic variables, but it shifts according to culture and place. And uh, that's what it is. It, it accommodates the, de the deception that the devil gives. And of course, we know, understanding Satan himself and his character, in the book of Revelation, he is the great deceiver that deceiveth the whole world. Okay? The deception, the platform through which the devil operates as the god of this world, is religious deception. And he'll use any means and every means that he can to do that. So back to, to Revelation 17 then. It says here now that that the angel, <clears throat> sorry, speaks to John at the end of verse number one, I will show thee the judgment of the great whore, and notice this, that sitteth upon many waters. So this, this whore, this religious system that John sees, 
it says, sits upon many waters. If you drop down to verse number 15, would you notice this? He saith unto me, the waters which thou sawest, where the horse sitteth, are peoples and multitudes and nations and tongues. So again, I want to just bring this out to you that when John sees this, this has a far greater reach than papal Rome. Okay, a far greater reach since the time of its inception than just papal Rome. Um, I've oftentimes heard and read books on Mystery Babylon that, that define this as the Roman Catholic religion, of which it is and a part, but the inception of this goes far, great, far, far further back than Rome itself. So this, this religious system of Mystery Babylon has dwelled among kings and nations uh, from time immemorial here, at least, of course, since Genesis 10 and Nimrod. So let's talk about how this kingdom operates then. <clears throat> uh, th there's an operation to this kingdom. It is this, it, the devil's kingdom. Now we've established, of course, that this is not just the modern Roman Catholic Church. It predates Rome. This Babylonian mystery religion that is now manifest in Catholicism. If you've ever seen, was anybody here saved out of Catholicism? All right, so I'm preaching to the choir, right? <laughs> You understand very well, better than I do. I was not raised in that religion, but um, having been around it, and then of course when you go to the Vatican, if you've been there and you've watched the Mass and other things take place there, you, you just see the, the blatant idolatry that's around you, okay? So let's talk about how the kingdom operates then, because it does have a way that it operates. First of all, as we looked at a minute ago, in verse number three, this woman, this religious system, uh, the, the angel says here that she sits on a beast. It sits on a beast. Now, this is the same beast as, this, as is described in Revelation chapter 13. You can go back at your own time and look at that. Briefly, here's what this beast is. This beast is in reference to the seven ruling powers. The seven mountains that we see here are representative of something, of kingdoms, not of rocks and dirt. Okay, there's seven, there's seven mountains, speaking of the seven ruling powers. Uh, powers, and they are the dominant kingdoms of, of world history. So you probably know these to be true. We know, we know Egypt with the Pharaoh. Uh, we would know uh, Assyria with Sennacherib. You'd know Babylon with Nebuchadnezzar. Uh, after that, you would know, of course, Persia with Cyrus. You would know, of course, Greece with Alexander. You would know Rome with Caesar. Those are six. The seventh will come. And in Revelation, John is told about that seventh kingdom that the woman is going to ride the, the beast. It's the same thing. She's riding the, the seven dominant world powers down through human history. The seventh, of course, is the kingdom under the Antichrist, of which the woman will ride that beast for a period of time. So what you need to know is this. The woman herself, this mystery Babylonian religion, the woman herself is not an empire. She rides an empire. The woman rides the beast. The beast is these seven kings, these seven world powers. She rides the empire and uh, ultimately, of course, uh, yet future, the empire of the Antichrist. So in other words, here's, if you look at it the other way, we know the woman rides the, the beast, which is the empires of the world. But you need to understand that from the reverse, the empires of the world carry this religious system with them. They allow her to ride them, you understand, down through time. Uh, down through history. So generation to generation in humanity, this woman has uh, been carried by the empires of the world. She is the harlot that influences empires and kingdoms, the most recent one, of course, being Rome. Okay, that's who she is. Um, her appearance, if you're looking here, uh, it says in verse number four of chapter 17, that the woman was arrayed in purple and scarlet color, and decked with gold and precious stones and pearls, having a golden cup in her hand full of abominations and filthiness of her fornication. So this, this religious whore that we see here is obviously defined for us here and very clearly pictorially defined and described as the modern Roman Catholic Church. I don't think anybody can deny that to be true. But the commercial city of, of Babylon is defined in chapter number 18. Uh, which I mentioned to you a little while ago. So she appears a certain way. She's arrayed in all of this. And uh, this is uh, this purple, scarlet, gold, precious stones, and pearls. Now, this is what the world around us worships and desires. This kind of thing that the woman is arrayed in. She's being carried by the kingdoms of the world. She is, her appearance is this way. It's rich and royal. And, and she's being carried along in that deception by the kingdoms of the world. And that explains why the world shelters her 
and drinks of her abominations. This is what the world is looking for in religion. They're looking for wealth, prosperity, uh, opulence, uh, ruling, reigning, king, kings and queens. That's what the world is looking for. And so you, you see that manifest in pretty much every false religion in the world today, don't you? The temples and the grand edifices that are built to just monuments to idolatry around our world, doesn't matter where you've been. You might have gone to the, the third world and seen Hinduism or Buddhism. Uh, you could have seen Islam and the temples of that, of course, Mormonism and I mean, all the rest of it. And so that's what the world worships. And so that's what she cloaks herself in as a part of her deception. So the woman sits on a beast. But notice what the woman gives them. She gives them a golden cup full of abominations. And so it, it talks about here that they drink from this in verse number four. She has a golden cup in her hand full of abominations and the filthiness of her fornication. So give, she gives the kings and kingdoms of this world a golden cup. It's interesting, Jeremiah gives reference to this prophetically in chapter number 51 about Babylon itself has a golden cup in the Lord's hand and he makes all the kings of the earth to drink of it. Now this cup that John is seeing here about uh, mystery, this mystery religion, it is full of abominations. The Lord tells us that here. It's, it's spiritual prostitution. Now what is this? It's rebellion against the true God. Man's nature, as we know, has always been to rebel against his creator. Okay? It found its freest expression under Nimrod, which is spread out into this whole world through this false religious system. So what this idolatry is that we see here is just a rebellion against the true God. It's the, the mystery religion that the kings of the earth have drunk. And we need to know that this is one cup down through the millennia. She has a golden cup. She's caused all the kings of the earth to drink it. This is not just speaking of modern Rome religious Rome today. It's down through history. She's caused the kings of the world to drink of this cup. It's all one cup. Mohammedism. It's the same cup. It's the same religion. You know, the, the high god of Mecca years ago was understood to be Hubal, Baal, the high god of Mecca, the moon god, which they now say is Allah, the one true god, but it's not. Okay, it's the same religion, Buddhism, Hinduism, animism, which a, a, a huge part of our world is animistic. If you haven't traveled outside of the Western world, you may not know that, but it's, it's dominant in a big part of our third world. Catholicism, much of Protestant Christianity. Now, the reason I say that is those particular um, denominations under Protestant Christianity that still hold to the sacraments of which there are many, hold to the sacraments of the, or the rites of the Catholic Church. Uh, baptismal regeneration. It's one of the sacraments, right? Justification by works, things like that. Um, even some of the, the, the Pentecostal movement of today, uh, emotion and experience over biblical truth, uh, so much of the same uh, religious uh, ideology is pushed into uh, what we understand to be Pentecostalism today. Not every Pentecostal, certainly, but uh, a big percentage of those. So what, what it is, is this is the, this mystery religion is the ecumenical church of today. And there was a day in my life that I didn't really understand what ecumenicism was. But, you know, as, as we get older and we get around a little bit, we, we see it very visibly. And uh, the ecumenical church is alive and well in our world today. It's not a very big city up here on the mountain, but this would be an ecumenical city like every other city in the world. Okay, this is very much alive and well. It's a watering down of the Bible. And what it does is it makes a religious book that's palatable for everybody. It's the thousand and one versions that, that come out that continue to water down the truth of the Word of God until finally it appeals to, to the masses. But I've got news for you. The Bible was never meant to appeal to the masses. But what you have is you have the ecumenical religion of mystery, Babylon. It's the coming together of the world's religions. What are they doing? They're coming together under the common bond of what we agree on. We're going to leave everything else off to the side and we're going to come together and we're going to say, well, what, what do we agree on? Well, they don't agree on very much, but they're quite happy to fall under the same banner on the things that they agree on. And so what is this? This is a departure from biblical truth. That's what this is. This is the ecumenical church. Now I'm telling you, this 
when, when you understand this religious system, which, which God said is the mother of harlots and abominations of the earth. So understanding where it came from, the fact that it has influenced for nearly 6,000 years of human history, every culture in our world, and is very much alive and well in your city, you understand this, then when you understand this, if you were to take a stand as a Bible-believing Christian against this, you are very much going to stand alone. You will have friends and family who will not agree with you. They will be angry with you. They will call you bigoted and intolerant and mean-spirited. And you don't even have to say anything mean-spirited. You just have to take them back to the scriptures. But so many people uh, have fallen into this ecumenical mindset, which, again, for those of us that have read the Bible, we understand this should not be a surprise to us. Uh, didn't Paul say that the world was going to wax worse and worse? There are going to be deceivers who are deceiving and being deceived themselves. And that's just the condition of the whole world, which, of course, when you see deception again, going back to this being the benchmark of Satan's strategy in our world today, to deceive the world religiously. This is what this religious system is. Um, Paul simply says it this way to Timothy, it's a form of godliness. And that's why it has such power, in, particularly in the Western world. The Western world would have been to a large degree, influenced by Christianity, okay? So we would consider ourselves here in Australia to be a part of the Western world. And so what you have is you have an element of truth, just grains of truth with a whole cup full of lies. And those grains of truth make it appear palatable to the masses because it's cloaked in Christianity. And it seems right. It looks right. They use the same words. Have you noticed? Many of the same words, very different meanings. That's where we get the, the understanding of semantics, meaning it's a word that means something different to you than it means to me. So going back to the absolute authority of what the Scripture says, then it breaks down the semantical wall and allows you to be able to say, this is exactly what the Bible says this means. Okay, So this is just a form of godliness. It borrows an amalgamation of all these false religions. It, it's The ecumenical church has borrowed so much of Eastern mysticism and brought it right into uh, professing Christianity, uh, the occult, charismatic teachings. All of this is the ecumenical church of today. All right, so let's look then, as we finish off here, uh, let's look at why and when the kingdom ends. Uh, because listen, it's going to end. That's a good thing right there. Okay. If we could jump up and click our heels, we'd do it right here, okay? It's going to end. Now, we're living in the middle of it, and uh, we're having to deal with it. And uh, we can still, listen, we can still have our joy. We can have our happiness. We can still fulfill the will of God. We can accomplish the Great Commission. We can do all that we've been left here to do in the middle of all of this because we're not in here blind. We're fully informed as believers in Christ with a Word of God in front of us. We're fully informed as to what the Lord said it is. And we know how to fight it, right? We fight it with truth. You have the indwelling Spirit of God if you're saved. You have all that you need to live godly in Jesus Christ. So you have everything you need. So this is not a time for us to, to, to drop our heads in defeat. No, this is the time to continue on. Uh, the Lord has chosen for us to live in this time. And so we, we've got to do the thing that God has given us to do. So the encouraging thing is that the kingdom is going to end. But let's talk about, first and foremost, why is this kingdom going to end, this religious system? Okay, this system in, in Second, uh, Second Thessalonians, the Lord defines this system as the mystery of iniquity. Okay, what is this religious system? Well, essentially it's this. It's the spirit of Antichrist. Okay, we know Antichrist will manifest itself in the person of the Antichrist, but the spirit of Antichrist is in this world and has been for a long time. Even John talked about that, the, the spirit of Antichrist, which is even now in the world. Okay, so this, this is the spirit of Antichrist, and, um, and it, what it is, is it, it's something that stands in direct opposition to the revelation of God. Now, this should not surprise us. This is what the devil has sought to do from the very beginning, is to, to try to dismantle and certainly discredit the revelation of God. And he, he did that with Eve uh, in the garden, and uh, it has been manifest in human history that uh, what the devil is trying to do is overthrow the worship of God. Now, uh, let me just read you a verse or two here. In uh, Acts in chapter, chapter number 7, Stephen, before he dies, you know, his first and last sermon, 
um, Stephen is, is preaching here. He says, Then God turned, speaking of His own people, gave them, speaking of Israel, God turned and gave them up to worship the host of heaven. Uh, as it is written in the book of the prophets, O ye house of Israel, have ye offered to me slain beasts and sacrifices by the space of 40 years in the wilderness? Now what was the problem? Well, they turned to their god Remphan and borrowed his star, which you have hanging on the back wall right there, and uh, they have turned it into the worship of the host of heaven. Okay, what is that? That's the seeking to overthrow the worship of the one true God. So bad was it that when Israel was delivered from Egypt, God stated to Moses that one of the primary reasons for the ten plagues is so that he might reveal himself to his own people. They'd forgotten who he was. Moses said, when I go and tell them that God sent me, what am I going to tell them? They don't know who you are. And he said, well, you just tell them that I am sent you. Okay, so Israel had forgotten who God was to a large extent. And so this has happened, the, the overthrow of the worship of God. In Matthew in chapter 4, no surprise to probably many or all of us here, when Jesus was driven into the wilderness by the Spirit of God to be tempted by the devil, what was one of the great temptations of Christ in the wilderness? Hey, I'll give you all of this if you'll fall down and worship me. What is that? It's seeking to overthrow the worship of God. This has, been, this has been Satan's strategy since the beginning, is to overthrow the worship of God. Romans in chapter 1, this is a, a, a great a great chapter, a great verse, particularly as we think about this topic. He's speaking of the, uh, the innate sin nature of man and uh, the exceeding wickedness of man in that nature. And it says that they've turned the truth of God into a lie and they worship and serve the creature more than the Creator who's blessed forever. Amen. All right, so what is that? That is the system which we see very much alive in our world today of the worship of the natural world and not the worship of God. So Gaia and Mother Earth and the worship of the world. Okay, it's very much alive and well today. Uh, all of this is uh, systematically um, uh, the, the part of the religion of uh, Antichrist, this mystery religion. And this is why it will be dismantled because it's seeking to overthrow the worship of God. So I think all eternity is going to reveal the, the mass deception that this has foisted upon humanity down through the years. It breaks my heart to know people very close to me, uh, some family and many friends who, who are caught up in this kind of religious system. They're dear, sweet people. I think many of them have, in, in their own way, a fear of God and even a, a love and devotion for spiritual things. They speak of a God that they do not know personally. They know things about the Bible, but they don't know the God of the Bible. Breaks my heart to see it. So I think only, only eternity is going to reveal to us just this mass deception. This, this mystery religion, here's what it does. It feeds off the sinful nature of man. Okay, you, you and I, as we sit here today, um, we, we all have different temperaments, personalities, likes and dislikes. It's just created in us as it, the unique individuals that we are. You might like McDonald's, you might like Hungry Jacks, you might like none of it. We're just unique that way, okay? And so it is in, in matters of worship. A man in his sinful nature has a desire to worship something. We're driven to worship. You can't hardly go to a place in this world. Of all the places I've been in this world, I've never been to a place that, that men did not worship something. And I've been some of the most remote places in our world today, and I've seen people driven to worship something who know nothing about the true God. Okay? So, so what this mystery religion does uh, is, is it feeds off of this nature of man to worship something and what the unregenerate man is driven to do is worship something other than God. And so Satan capitalizes on that. And this, this religious system of mystery, Babylon, uh, is waiting in the wings uh, to feed the natural inclination of man. And it's going to give him whatever he wants. That's why you have, uh, do you have Baskin Robbins up here? You know what that is? They used to advertise Baskin Robbins as, what was it, like 31 flavors or something? Yeah, you, know, you know what I'm talking about? Um, so basically, whatever you want, you just come in here, we'll give you any flavor you want. Okay, that is this mystery religion. It does exactly the same thing. It's just religion your way. Well, what do you want? I passed on the way here yesterday, some Baha'i church down the way. Okay, and on their, on their sign, they're very bold about saying, uh, every religion is a pathway to God. Well, that's what they say. Uh, you'd be surprised how many millions of people in our world believe that to be true. What is that? The mystery religion. There's many pathways to God. The Pope himself said just not two, three weeks ago, the exact same thing. 
Did you hear that? Yes. Okay, again, it doesn't surprise us as Bible-believing Christians, but the world knows nothing about this. So what is this? This is the mystery religion which feeds off of the natural inclination, the sinful nature of man to be driven to worship. And it's right there with, with the 31 flavors or whatever it is. How do you want to worship? You can have it. Do you want to put on a funny hat and not eat meat? Then okay, you can do it that way. Do you want to kill the barbarians? And say, Okay, you can do it that way. Whatever you want, I'll give it to you. Okay, and that's this mystery religion, and that's why the Lord is going to dismantle it. And the devil, what he's doing is he's achieving his goal of the seduction of humanity. Okay, okay so that's why it ends. Sorry, I didn't actually turn it, did I? You want to see that there? I'll give it a minute. So this is what I said to you a minute ago. Let me, let's move on as we finish off here today. Let's talk about when it ends. Okay, when this religious system ends. Now keep in mind, I mentioned to you, chapter 17 of Revelation deals with this religious system, this religious mystery. Chapter 18 deals with the, the commercial city called Babylon, okay, um, in its two forms. But the end of the city in chapter 18 is sudden and cataclysmic, okay? It says that it's destroyed in one hour, chapter 18 and verse number 10. In one hour is thy judgment come. Whereas the end of the religious system in chapter 17 mystery, this Babylonian religion, the, the end of this religious system comes in a process during the midpoint of the tribulation. This is when this religious system will end. Now, the idolatry does not end, but in its mystery form, the way John sees it, it ends at that three and a half year mark. So initially, um, okay, initially, hey, the devil's in the sound system. We know that to be true, don't we? All right. Um, <clears throat> So initially, we know that there's 10 kings, okay? And these 10 kings at the end, they rise in federation together um, with the Antichrist. We know that that takes place. And what they do is they overthrow this, this religious system of Babylon. Look at verse number 16 of chapter 17. Notice in verse number 15, these waters um, uh, are peoples, multitudes, nations, and tongues. Look at verse 16. And the 10 horns which thou sawest upon the beast, these shall hate the whore and shall make her desolate and naked, and shall eat her flesh, and burn her with fire. For God hath put in their hearts to fulfill His will, and to agree, and to give their kingdom unto the beast." Do you see that? "...until the words of God shall be fulfilled, and the woman which thou sawest is that great city which reigneth over the kings of the earth." So here's what you have. You have this religious system that has now been uh, epitomized, if you will, in the Church of Rome, which is a city-state but religious system all wrapped into one. Uh, and in the midpoint of the tribulation, that will end, okay? That religious system is going to be overthrown by the ten confederated kings who rise up with the Antichrist and overthrow uh, Rome. Now, the reason, the reason for the overthrow is very simple. God defines it for us here. There's a new religion established during the midpoint of the tribulation. Daniel refers to this as the abomination of desolation. Now, what is that? Paul defines that for us by telling us that when the Antichrist uh, sets himself up in the temple, the tribulation temple, he says, I am God. And he will, he will drive men to worship him. He'll seek to destroy the Jews at that point. Of course, you know all of that, okay? So what you have is at the midpoint of the tribulation, that religious system that has been carried on the backs of nations until this point has thrived and flourished and been lifted up by the kingdoms. But at the midpoint of the tribulation, the Antichrist says, now I'm God. And the ten kings rise and overthrow that religious system because there can't be, there can't be two forms of worship under the Antichrist. He reigns supreme uh, for a short, very short period of time. Okay? He reigns supreme there. Okay? So this is the, the abomination of desolation that Daniel spoke about. And all existing religions must fall. And so the kingdom ends at this point. Now, <clears throat> after this, of course, is the removal of the Antichrist, which is in chapter 19 of the book of Revelation. Uh, we'll look at a little bit of this uh, in our next hour. But uh, the Antichrist and the false prophet are cast into the lake of fire. Their influence is now gone. And then, of course, we know that the ultimate end, and this is, uh, this is again, shouting time, as they say, the ultimate end comes with the judgment of the father of lies, uh, who himself is cast into the lake of fire in Revelation and chapter number 20. So let me just say a couple of things here before we finish. Uh, I, I realize there's a lot here. 
Uh, and if we were to have more time, we could probably deal a whole lot more specifically about what this mystery religion looks like than we've looked at today. But let me just say a couple things to you. Um, if you're here today as a born-again Christian, meaning you've put your faith in the shed blood and resurrection of Jesus Christ for your sin, okay? If you're here as, as a Christian, um, this is an opportunity for you and I to shine as lights in a dark world. Uh, we, we have still been given a commission by the Lord to reach the world with the gospel. Now, what, what we should do from a study like this is be challenged and spurred to consider the lost around us, particularly those who may be mixed up and blinded by this idolatry. When Paul was sent out to the Gentile world, the Lord told him in Acts 26 that one of his purposes was to go into the Gentiles to open their eyes and to turn them from darkness to light. Uh, from the power of Satan to God, that they may receive forgiveness of sins. Okay, so Paul was given that commission. It's the same commission you and I have as Bible-believing Christians. It was not apostolic. It's for all of us. The gospel is the power of God in Romans 1, uh, unto salvation to everyone that believeth. And we have a job to do. And so when we, when we study this religious kingdom and its deception in the world, thank the Lord that if you're here as a Christian, biblically a Christian today, you have not been deceived this way. But man, shouldn't it make us consider those that we know and love that are, that are lost in this and to pray more deeply and more intentionally uh, for them, for their salvation and to, to try to just uh, use the scriptures to help people, lost people get saved. Uh, as I mentioned about that woman just a couple of days ago, a classic example, raised by nuns. I mean, she was as deep into this as I've ever seen. And yet at 72 years of age, the Lord began to knock on her door and say, something's not right. And she was ready to get saved. It just encouraged me. There, there's no lost cause, okay? So that's the first thing I want to say. And secondly, before I'm done here today, um, you may be here today and you're not saved. And I don't know if that's true. But if you've listened to this today and you may be caught up in a system like this of religion, but you, you know down deep inside of you that you're not sure what would happen when you die. And you don't know Jesus Christ as your Savior from sin. And, and, and if that's you today, I just want you to know that you can receive the gospel and be born again today. You can have your sin forgiven today. And Jesus Christ alone is the one who can, for, can forgive sin. And I want to encourage you today, at some point in all of this, um, if you're not sure that you're saved today, there's a number of us that would be delighted to sit down with the Bible and show you from the Scripture how you can know that Jesus Christ can save you from your sins. So please don't leave here today without having that settled, all right? Why don't we have a word of prayer? Our Father, thank you for your word today. Uh, thank you for helping us to see this religious system, at least to some extent now. Thank you for these that have been saved out of it. And Lord, I thank you that the gospel is still as powerful as it ever was to save the lost, even those who are blinded in their idolatry. So help us, Lord, to do all that we can to reach the lost with the gospel. Uh, thank you, Lord, for giving us the privilege of, uh, of giving this message to lost people around the world. But Lord, I pray if there's somebody here today that needs to be saved, that they would do that today before it's eternally too late, that they would repent of their sin, put their faith in Jesus Christ. And we'll thank you for now in Jesus' name. Amen.